Hi, this is Fred. Hi, this is Adam Smith calling from NobelPrize.org, the website of the Nobel Prize. Yes, hi, Adam. Nice to talk to you. Sorry I missed your earlier call. Not at all. It's lovely to talk to you. <laughs> Delighted to, to find you. Um, gosh, yes, you had uh, a pretty unusual way of discovering the news. How did it actually happen? <laughs> I did. Um, it's funny. I've talked more about this than I have to press. Um, <laughs> so my wife and I were camping uh uh, high up in the mountains of Wyoming near Yellowstone National Park. And uh, we got snowed on and we're completely off there. There's no service up there or anything. So my phone is on airplane mode. And uh, and we got out, uh, which wasn't necessarily obvious, but we got out and drove to Yellowstone National Park and saw bison and antelope and moose and all sorts of um, great wildlife. Uh, and then we actually go through a small town. My wife's phone, which was not in airplane mode, blew up. Um, and uh, I was out walking the dogs, and she started yelling, and I thought there was a grizzly bear nearby. Uh, <laughs> turns out it was not a grizzly bear, and she said, you won the Nobel Prize. And I said, I did not. <laughs> and she said, yes, you did. I have 200 text messages that said you won the Nobel Prize. I was like, Okay, apparently I won the Nobel Prize. Um, so then we had to drive another hour to get to where I could get uh, cell service and Wi-Fi. And so I uh, we checked into a hotel uh, in a small little town in southern Montana. And uh, I got online and started making phone calls. And um, it's been pretty amazing to last 24 hours or <laughs> 18 hours now at this point. And you're still making phone calls for you, yeah? <laughs> How? Yeah, well, I am. It's, it's okay. Yeah, I suppose you had the chance when you heard this news to turn around and go back into the wilderness for another day or two just to... <laughs> <laughs> I guess I could have, but uh, no, no. This is it's, it's too uh, too exciting and um, uh, just too important to, to ignore. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's been fantastic. It's one of the best stories ever of hearing the news. It's marvellous. And it's interesting because... Um, Mary Bronco tells the story of how she did get the call at night, but she saw it was from Sweden and therefore thought it was spam and so just switched her phone off. Yeah. And your stories together speak to how little you were expecting this. It really wasn't on your radar. That That is true. I met Mary's a good friend. One of the first calls I made yesterday was to Mary. Um, you may not know, but uh, uh, six, eight years ago, uh, I... Shimon Sakaguchi and Sasha Rodensky won the Crayford Prize. Yes. Um, also a family, family prize there in, in Sweden. And we went over and it was fantastic. And I think I and Mary and everyone involved in this just assumed that that was the, that was the recognition that we were going to get. That was, so it was fantastic. We had a, one of the best times of my life. It was amazing. Um, and thought, okay, so that, that will be the recognition for this discovery. So we put Nobel Prize out of our heads completely. Um, so yeah, it was it was definitely a shock. I was uh, I'm still amazed. I suppose I can't pry into your call with Mary, but I'd love to know what the two of you said to each other when you spoke. Oh well, um, <laughs> there, was, there were some colorful language used. Um, our spouses were both on the phone. We both uh, were both pretty amazed. Um, but you know, we said you know we need to. One of her comments was, "I think I need to go dress shopping now." <laughs> um, apparently, you do, Mary. We have to we have to dress up for this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll have to figure out what we're going to talk about and coordinate things a little bit and stuff. But uh, now we'll 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 get together as soon as I'm back in Seattle and, uh, and celebrate properly. One of the interesting things about um, you is that uh, and, and the prizes that you've worked mainly in biotechs in industry. Um, not not in academia, right. and I suppose that's probably becoming increasingly common among laureates, but it's still fairly unusual. Why do you find that environment has been more productive for you, do you think? You know, um, it's a great question, and I'm glad someone's asked. Um, so when I was finishing my postdoctoral fellowship at the NIH, uh, I was looking for both at biotech and academic positions. And, and even then, this is back in the late 80s, early, early 90s, sorry, um, even back then, and I found the small-ish biotech uh, environment to be incredibly stimulating. And what I loved about it was it brought together and brings together people with very different skill sets who are incredibly good at what they do. Uh, but you're all focused on just trying to make something that will eventually make it into the clinic and treat patients. And so being surrounded 
by these people having an incredibly team oriented environment with a, a really good focus just very much appealed to me. That's really fascinating. And I suppose also in the story of the um, regulatory T cells, th there's a lot of connections made between different areas. It's different people to come in together, and you can really see how you need that diversity of expertise and ideas to to pull things together to make the connections, as well as individuals who are far sighted enough to see the connections. Yeah, absolutely. But but I will say it was interesting. So when we figured this out back in 2000, actually the late 90s, 98, and 99 or 2000, mm. it, it was very clear to us. In fact, we wrote in patents that if you could if you could harness these cells, you could treat autoimmune disease. But back in the year 2000, no one was going to do gene therapy in vivo. No one was going to do cell therapy for autoimmune diseases. There weren't even cell therapies for cancer at that point. It was too expensive, too hard. You know, all, all the reasons which were true at the time, um, which are no longer true. And so you could see the path, but you couldn't get there. Mm. And and so then by working with academic collaborators, Sasha Wadensky was a, was a great friend and has been a great collaborator of mine um, throughout my life. And, you know, Sasha and I could sit down and say, you know, what can you do? Because he, there's, there are things in academia he could do that I just wasn't going to do. And so, you know, came back full circle. Five years ago, Sasha and I, and mostly spearheaded by Jeff Bluestone and a colleague of his at UCSF, Keithy Tong, um, started Sonoma Biotherapeutics because now you can see a way to actually turn this, this fundamental discovery from the year 2000 into an actual drug. And so now there are clinical trials running, patients are being treated, um, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see where it ends up. There are other groups doing it as well. Um, so, I, you know, again, there, there is this interplay between what you can do in a biotech and then what you can do in academia. And they really feed off each other very well if, if you're lucky and, and, uh, and take advantage of it. And such an interesting point that in collaborations, you know, you're basically when you come to collaborations, it's asking, what can I do for this collaboration? What can I bring to this problem? What is it that I can do that's special? Absolutely. You know, um, people sometimes don't want to give away anything. And I've always thought, you know, half of something is better than all of nothing. <laughs> Let's make this work. And then and then there, everyone will be happy at the end of the day if you can actually make it work. And I, I still fundamentally believe that to be true. That's great. Thank you. Okay, and lastly, I, I, we have to give a shout out to the scurfy mouse because, <laughs> <the, laughs> yes, that mouse. Yes, you contributed know, it, a lot too. <laughs> it, it, it it did, and and again, this is the, this is one of these things which is I'm I'm really happy. It's well, happy at multiple levels for the award, but but I'm very happy that this gives an opportunity to do things like shout that out because that mouse. Um, originated during the Manhattan Project in the United States at Oak Ridge National Labs. And there's a group there who kept that line of mice, not the individual mouse, obviously, but the line of mice alive for, I don't know, hundreds, if not thousands of generations from the late 40s until the uh, 90s when we actually discovered it, basically, in, the, in their facility. Mm. And, you know, the the forethought to do that and just the the staying power to be able to, because it costs a lot of money, right? So to be able to just keep that alive and keep that line going for that length of time, thinking it was important, but not knowing exactly how is, is just a testament to the, to the, um, the, the people who actually um, did that work and had the forethought or uh, foresight to, to, um, maintain it. I, I, I'm, I'm really in awe of the fact that, that they were able to do that for so long. It's, it's, it's incredible. What, what better story could you have to advocate for basic research and just the need to keep everything going, everything you can going? Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah you never know. I mean, it's one of hundreds of lines there and oh. other ones are probably valuable as well, but this is, this is the one I know the best. Obviously. Fantastic. It's been an absolute joy speaking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Bye now. Cheers. You just heard a special episode of Nobel Prize Conversations. 
For more listening, we think you'll enjoy our brand new bonus episode, where Adam reveals what really gets our laureates celebrating. You can hear it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.